Welcome everyone. Uh, we'll begin today's event with opening remarks from the Dean of the College of HRSM, David Cardinan. So David, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Erica. It's, a, it's a great to be here. So I want to welcome everybody. Uh, today's a great day for the College of uh, Hospitality, Retail and Sport Management as we host our first HRSM Distinguished Lecture, uh, Mr. Tricky Stewart. Uh, Mr. Stewart, I can't thank you enough for, for taking time to, to meet with our, our students and to, and to be here today. Um, we are honored to have you uh, virtually today, but I do extend a, an invitation to come to campus anytime. We'd love to, to host you here and, and, and have you see our campus and, uh, and meet with our students face to face. Um, it's not very often to, to get a privilege to meet a multi Grammy award winner, uh, much less the time for them to come and speak to our students. Um, I have to confess, uh, Mr. Stewart, that last night um, I was talking to my daughters uh, about uh, about you, and uh, they immediately started singing, uh, I'm a single lady. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so that last night, my, my house turned into a mini dance party as we listened to a lot of the works that you've created. Um, I still think one of my favorites is Who Dat by uh, TJ Money. Uh, that was some of your early works, and uh, you really had a new vibe at that time. So it's a, your, your work is very much... Um, it, it, it really changed uh, what, what, what we listened to. So just a quick recap, um, uh, Mr. Stewart's career expands over 30 years, uh, over 100 mil million records sold, uh, 7 billion streams generated. Uh, he's a true professional and a pioneer uh, in the music and entertainment industry. Um, so our, our distinguished, um, our HRSM Distinguished Lecture Series was developed to have industry giants like yourself and leaders provide guidance and words of wisdom to our students. Uh, we wanted to expose our students to those who have helped mold and change our industry uh, So as we prepare the next generation uh, of leaders. Uh, Mr. Stewart, your, your career is amazing as, as a music executive. Um, your strong commitment to fostering the next generation of industry leaders um, makes you a perfect candidate to be our first HRSM Distinguished Lecturer. Um, so I, I'm going to tell the students, make sure you pay attention. Um, uh, I highly encourage them to ask questions. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand the program off uh, over to Mr. Rashid Mohammed, our own homegrown superstar, um, an HRSM retail alum, uh, to uh, Dean's Leadership Council member to help introduce you. Um, uh, Rashid, thank you so much for making this day possible, making this connection. Uh, and with that, I'd like for you to introduce uh, Mr. Tricky Stewart. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining the, uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series today. And one thing I wanted to say about Tricky as I bring him on is you all know Tricky for producing and songwriting and collaborating on some of the most iconic songs of our time and also creating masterful hits for artists like Beyonce, Justin Bieber, Rihanna, Britney Spears, and many more. But what you may not know about him is that he is also a developer and a creative entrepreneur. Tricky is a music executive and an independent record label, and he co-founded and owns two record recording studios, along with developing a roster of new artists. He's also a humanitarian with a huge heart and a passion for education, while also being a champion for the underserved. As a visionary, Tricky's music architecture has defined culture. It's challenged the music paradigm. It bo it's both dynamic and timeless, leaving room for reinterpretation and interpolation for years to come. Amidst my friend's many accolades, uh, as a, he's of course a five-time Grammy award-winning recipient and has been recognized in the top five of Billboard's list of the 50 greatest music producers of the 20th and 21st century. And while I refer to Tricky as my good friend and brother, he doesn't know this, but I'll share it with you now, uh, I still have to pinch myself occasionally when I see his name show up on my call log because I'm a big fan as well. So without further ado, everyone, I would like to introduce my good friend, Tricky Stewart, as our distinguished lecturer for today. And Tricky, without further ado, I will pass it off to you to begin. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, you know, one thing sounds for sure is that I might be getting old. You know, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff that's gone on, and uh, I appreciate the warm words, Rashid. Um, you know, I feel, you know, very strongly about you, and I, I appreciate you bringing me here to do this because you know that I am really passionate about how my world meets and what the ancillary things that I've gotten in my journey um, through music. My journey in music, I started when I was um, 15 years old, believe it or not. 
I was born into a musical family, a very musical family um, and, at a very significant level. Um, but behind, behind the scenes, for the most part, everybody had dedicated themselves to kind of being, whether it was a record producer or a background singer for Aretha Franklin, or whether it was being the executive producer of the Oprah Winfrey show or so forth and so on. But my family's life is, um, is music in a sense. And I did everything that I could to really try not to be part of that. Um, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an athlete. And ultimately, uh, it was just something that had a calling on my life as far as just I was born with um, the ability to hear, uh, hear very well. And so I've my gift of making music, loving music, being passionate about music and having a very serious focus on it once the light kind of went on for me and it went on for at 15 for me I was the only one in my family that probably never took a lesson of any kind I don't have any formal training but my ears as far as just my ability to identify things that are catchy um, and particularly work um, I think almost like psychologically of making people feel like things are repetitive and that they get into your mind and that you ultimately have a feeling. I, I hope that my music over the years has put a feeling of happiness um, out there. It's a, it's a frequency that I try to make sure exists in the music. And through that, and through all that passion and finding my early calling, ultimately it put me in a position where this world of me working with these big superstars, whether it's Mariah Carey, Justin Bieber, The Dream, Frank Ocean, whoever it is. The thing is, as a producer, when I started and the part that I brought to it from my family side was that we had a music production company. So we, I wasn't, I was never just a music producer. I belonged to a music production company. So when people talk about Red Zone or RZ3, they are associating me with that brand, but ultimately, any time that I've um, been doing records for the last 30 years, I've always built an infrastructure of production and services of what actually makes you a real great music producer and ultimately what creates that experience beyond the music that allows in a business where people wanna uh, spit you out very quickly and say you're old or you, got, you, can, you only have this much time what are those things that are gonna separate me at that moment? And some of those things that I really got into was just the service of people, the service of understanding, anticipating needs of those that I was working for and with uh, before, they, before they knew that they needed them. So ultimately, not only was I getting uh, um, my opportunities based on what is my talent, which is actually making music, but the secondary part that came from that really had a lot to do with understanding the idea of service, anticipating people's needs, and ultimately having an approach to what I do. And the approach that I have to what I do is to really understand the idea that everything matters. <laughs> and that may sound like a daunting task, but in an approach of every aspect of my life that I want to have success in, the first thing that I do is I try to develop a mindset about how I'm going to do it. I know a lot of you guys heard uh, Kobe Bryant had the uh, Mamba mentality that he spoke about. And I think for successful people, there's always a mentality or a mindset that becomes upon you by the gathering of information as you're going on your education and as you're meeting people and as you're reading more information, you're gathering information to have enough that you can spit out there in an instinct, in an instinctual way, I should say, uh, when the opportunity meets the road. And from that standpoint, I think the, the common thing for me is always about going above and beyond. And whether that's in music or whether that was making sure 
that an artist had everything that they need because when an artist touched down in the city, if, if I live in Atlanta, I work out of Atlanta, right? So artists touch down, they want to know where to eat. They want to know where to go to the movies. They want to know where to go bowling, if they want to go paintballing, whatever they want to do, whatever starts a creative person's juices flowing. It's my job to have relationships with those places, make sure that they're secure, make sure that they're safe, and ultimately make sure that I have a, a relationship that makes them feel important. Because in dealing with people, whether they're stars, or whether they're just um, people, everyday working people, everybody has the need to want to feel important. And me working through music and working with these high level people has allowed me to really understand how much I really love servicing people, which is why I'm getting more into that through the music field. And that's my next, uh, my next chapters are really about creating creative spaces that ultimately speak to this concept, to this, to this vision that I have of how to make people feel valued, how to get people to be more creative, because the ancillary part of the successes that we get to talk about, there are so many that are not successes. You know, you miss way more than you're gonna make. And that's just the reality of most things that are successful. But what I've learned about the places where I didn't have massive success, and it doesn't come with a single ladies, it doesn't come with an umbrella, is that there's been a uh, huge impact on people's lives that do other things because of the approach that they learned working with us and doing music. And that approach is, um, is something that I have, one of the few things that I have control over in life just in general is to, is it I have to do this or I get to do this? Is it that, yes, I wanna be an individual in a workspace, but part of me being an individual is my approach is I wanna make everybody around me better. So whatever I can do to make you better in a workspace, that's what I'm willing to do. And in my teams that we work on, those are the things that I really stress. If there's a, if there's a message to it, of the ancillary thing that I've gotten from, from music, it's just, I really have this love of hospitality and how to bring hospitality, which actually doesn't cost money. It takes, it takes a mentality. It takes an approach. It just takes making people feel special, but people play millions of dollars for this stuff before, the, before people started innovating ways for people to have a level luxury time and that's the next concept is how do we keep that service going to the places that service usually isn't and that's the game for me thank you for listening to me um i hope that makes sense and from that point i would like to you know open it up to you guys and 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 talk a little bit that's awesome uh Tricky, uh, thanks Thanks again for joining us. I'm Professor Armin Shaomi in, in, in the Department of Sport and Entertainment Management. And I'll moderate a, a little bit, but I wanted to start by kind of kind of take 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 this all back a little bit because you did grow up in in quite a musical family. And I'm a I'm a musician myself. And I, I it was fascinating to me that you mentioned that there was no formal training, but you always had an ear for music, what works, what doesn't work, and what what might be a, a, a catchy phrase. And I was looking and reading a little bit about your background and I came up on the fact that you wrote your first, uh, I guess, song that be became a bit of a hit when you were only 15 years old. So the creativity started really early. Can you kind of tell us, how, how, I mean, how does a teenager kind of write songs? Were you also doing the melodic, like the, the melody as well? Or was it lyrics or was it both? Or how, how did that kind of come about at such an early age? And I think, well, my mom, my mom and my dad, right? Um, mom is a choir director and put together an all women's choral group. My dad was also a choir director, right? And so ultimately what happened is they met in a choir competition where my mom beat my dad. So every house that we were in had a piano. 
Um, my dad was a classical pianist as well. My mom plays piano. My grandma's played piano uh, in Oregon and cousins played drums. And so playing an instrument was like going outside to play. It was nothing I gave a lot of thought to. It was just something that I knew I could do. If I saw an instrument, I knew I could play it, whether I touched it before or not, just because I had seen it played my whole life. And and um, and I'm also, by the way, for everyone that wants to ask, there's a, there's a separate Q and A box, so feel free to ask questions. One of the questions we had, and and I want you to know, Tricky, you know, our college really covers. It's fascinating because you said you you really, you really take care of the hospitality, the service aspect of an artist coming, like the whole whole package, and that's really what our college is about. I thought that was very cool that you mentioned that. But one of the questions we have is for those that are not as familiar with what really does a record producer actually do as it relates to bringing a song to the public? So can you give us a very kind of kind of brief overview from, from like discovery to us hearing it? Yes. You know, okay, what's so the process? What it is, it's, it's a couple of different things, right? But I'll try to make this as simple as possible. The producer is the contracted person that works for a record label who's ultimately responsible for making and being in charge of the record. The record meaning every decision that gets made about that record. If there's writers that need to be brought in, who are the collaborators? What does the songs need to be about? What's the tempo? Are we going, what, what's the type of album are we making? Sonically handling the financial aspect of putting all that together, budgeting uh, contracts, finishing all the contracts of everybody that you call. You are truly a contractor, but most importantly, what you're responsible for is the final results of what we know um, to be a record. Think of it much like a director of a picture. You know, that person is directing the scenes. I'm going through the vocal takes. I'm the one that's there telling the artist, no, not like this. Like, it needs to be more like this. I need your, I need to feel your heart right here. I need to feel like you're crying. You know, it's every little detail in that part, plus an added bonus of business that is never fun to do. <laughs> <laughs> it, it almost sounds like you're the film director. So in the film industry, you know, we have producers, but it's not the same as what a music producer does. The music producer really brings that final product to the public. Right. Um, so I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit. You were at Def Jam Records. Uh, it seems like it wasn't that long ago, really. Uh, and, you know, you've worked with hundreds of major artists and helped bring so many of them becoming uh, successful household names. When I was kind of going through your background with one of my classes, the students just were just amazed because I mentioned Frank Ocean, and that's someone that you signed while you were at uh, Def Jam Records. So mm -hmm. one question that came to mind is, how does that relationship come about? How do you discover somebody like, like a Frank Ocean or some of the many uh, dozens of other artists that you've, hundreds of other artists that you've brought to light? Like, you know, there's, there's no one way to do it. You know, um, what I typically do is I, I have friends, right? And I, my friends, I've been doing this a long time. So my, most of them do music. So we trade information. We pass around things on IG. IG has made life a lot easier. YouTube has made life a lot easier. But before we had people that lived in different places that just kind of kept an eye on things. We'd have a guy or a girl that might be up in um, like San Francisco. Then you might have someone that's letting you know what's happening in Houston or something like that. And then there's, there's just the idea of luck, friends. Someone saw somebody that was at church or that was great. Frank Ocean was brought to me by my best friend, the, one of my best friends. I watch football with this guy every weekend, real genuine uh, relationship. And he's also, but he also discovered Alessia Cara. Mm -hmm. He also discovered um, this guy named Simba that just dropped this week. Um, really great hip hop artist that I think is gonna change the game a bit. And he just has, he has a real talent for finding um, special people. And he became my best friend because he came in our company, we developed him. He was my writing partner and then he became my A&R and then he left the company, but we still work. We work at different places, we do different things, but we still as friends uh, exchange information. And that's kind of uh, one, of, it's it's a lot of word of mouth. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's just the luck of the draw really. Mm -hmm. 
So then in about 2011, I believe you became president of ANR at, at Epic Records. Yeah. And, and first of all, what an incredible position to hold at such a key time in, in the music industry. There's so much change going on, but mm. also for someone to be in their 30s and achieve that position is incredibly, I mean, impressive. What would you say are a couple of your your takeaways from your short but really intense time at, at Epic? Because you resigned a couple of years later because you really said you, you wanted to get back in the studio and be more creative. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, it you know, it looked like I resigned. That's it, what it really was, is that I said that I would do what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. And when I felt like they had what they needed, I was like, I just didn't resign. Right. And so okay. um, and what that mandate was, is that Epic Records had fallen from grace. Right. And so I needed to find artists. And uh, through that time, Future was brought in. Travis Scott was brought in. Um, uh, there was, uh, you know, the, um, what's the girls from Fifth Harmony, uh, Camilla, Be- mm-hmm. Camilla Cabello was, yeah. was at the time when I was there, we were also doing, um, the voice mm-hmm. at the same time I was working behind the scenes on the voice. So we had an opportunity to sign Fifth Harmony, you know, uh, we didn't do it at that time. It went to another affiliated label, but we really liked, uh, Camilla and, uh, we brought her over uh, when it was solo time. So, uh, that, that thing there was amazing because I think my big takeaways were that my big takeaway was probably that music, music is really a miracle to, um, to have, to have massive success. It's really hard. And I learned some things that really scared me that were like, gosh, my life is like super, like it can go either way because the people think, oh, you don't push records. They all get pushed the same. You know, it's not, you know, it's not, it's, it's about people. It's about a connection that happens with people. And that, that made me feel really blessed and also really weird at the same time. Cause I was like, man, this is hard, you know? And the other part, um, that you know took some adjusting to was just being in corporate um people not necessarily going all the way out you know the way you know that was different for me because um the big thing was every day on the outside which i love as being an independent i wake up with hope because everything is i'm hopeful about what will happen tomorrow uh when i when i was there and you are in control of other people's money, uh, you wake up with skepticism. Mm. And that's a very big trade-off for me, you know, because I need hope. Hope is the thing that, um, that that's the driving force. So although the things were more secure, you're making money, you, you know you're going to be in a good situation, but the trade-off between um, being hopeful and skepticism was something that was, uh, was uh, different. Mm-hmm. And so during the time that you you really developed your career and have been involved since, the music industry has rapidly changing, right? I mean, it went from having some of the best years with CDs, sales, and all that to, you know, the internet and Napster, and then now everything, we've kind of moved away from downloads, and now it's all streaming. Uh, we're not consuming CDs and records and any of that. So uh, with everything being streaming-based, has this changed the approach from a producer perspective and a label perspective as far as for signing new talent? Um, Because even though albums are released, I feel like at least my students, they're not approaching an album the same way I was when I would buy the whole record and read the liner notes and the lyrics. And it was kind of like all 12 songs were all kind of tied together. Um, What are some changes that you think has happened with music being more consumed through streaming? Well, I think I think it's two different things. I think just the same way that the eight track changed um the CDs and 45 changed, you know, the 30, you know, 33s. Um this is just evolution. But what I particularly like about streaming is that um transactional business was just a one-time sale. So when you talk about buying one album, um 
it's a one-time sale. And if you love, like, let's say you love Michael Jackson's thriller or something like that along the lines, and you, you might buy it a second time. Third time, m- maybe not so much. Mm-hmm. When you think about the uh, sh- what streaming has provided for creators, it's created for our music to live forever without ever getting a scratch on it, without it ever being damaged, whatever, without it being a box that gets thrown away when you move and you're like, I'm tired of moving that stuff around. And, you know, so from that that point, I think it's given music a lot more value as we move forward because it literally won't die. And it's also in the hands of its fans, which is all we ever ask for um, when making music is to not have a middle person out there because music, regardless of how successful it is, it is extremely fulfilling. And to have people have people stand between um, your ability and your love to do that, I just think from the standpoint of, um, you know, it's good and it's bad, but everything is good and bad. But I just think from the standpoint of people being able to creatively express themselves, I think that's another plus. But obviously, I think the the ability for music to live forever, for me to curate and be able to say, hey, you're coming over to my house, you're coming over to my place, or I'm having a party or whatever the situation is. And now I'm gonna put together these songs as I see fit from the artists that I think are interesting, uh, I think is a huge advantage for songs that last forever. You know, there's a song that I was surprised by the other day that I went and looked up a song called Africa by the by the um, band Toto, which mm-hmm. came out in probably in the 70s, I would imagine. And it had 1.3 billion streams. And I was like, whoa, they didn't see that coming. You know, like they never saw that coming. Mm-hmm. And to have records like that, that live forever, like and when how music can be consumed, there's so many places that need music as content providers. So you could have out a song that was sitting there that might not be doing anything. And the next thing you know, a music supervisor has found something that's exactly perfect what they need. And now six years later, there you are sitting at sitting doing whatever you're doing. And now you found out that something that you did six years earlier that you put into the ecosystem of music is now generating money for you that you weren't even depending on and I think that is a very cool factor absolutely um and I am getting a a few questions so I'm going to ask uh through the through the chat here as well that our attendees are asking um what's been one of the most difficult parts or times in your career and what did you do to kind of overcome those difficulties or challenges you know it's hard it's difficult every day because nobody wants the 48 year old producer right <laughs> like it's a it's a young person's game um it's been that way for a long time so we're talking four decades of music i have to reinvent myself constantly i'm constantly in my head I'm, am i doing the right thing do i sound young enough is it am i doing too much does this not matter like and so the mental fight to stay engaged to stay on top of what everybody's listening to having an appreciation for things that I don't even understand to just for the idea of understanding why they work, Um, not having an ego, you know, being committed to being committed to what it is that I want to accomplish, which is that billboard spot, you know, or that recognition of a song and specifically songs that the whole world knows. That's my genre, right? So it's like, if it's Justin Bieber's baby, it's like, there's a, there's kids right now today that know that song that weren't even alive when that song came out. And that's the point of how high my bar is for myself. And when, when I find myself doubting if I'm there, um, I have to, I have to refocus and I have to re um, reimagine my mental toughness, which is, which is hard sometimes because there's been people shooting for me for for three decades and i'm still here <laughs> well what's interesting because going through your discography and 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 i mean the list is never ending both artists wise and all the hits and so you know somebody had asked the question if there's a specific moment where you felt like, like you had achieved success but i feel like that's like quite often in some ways but was there a specific moment where you felt like okay you know this is 
this is cool like what? yeah um the, i mean the the first success that i ever felt was building a studio mm-hmm. that was like if if i never got a hit like building building triangle sound a 95 i was 19 years old um and that was very very important to me and um that was one and the other time that I really, really felt that where I was like, okay, you did some stuff. Now was, I was working with Lionel Richie mm-hmm. and Whitney Houston. And I was like, oh, you, yeah, you, you did it. You, you little kid from Dalton, Illinois moved across the country and figured it out. That's incredible. Um, what are some things that you like to do to help you with kind of like your creative process? the things you do outside the um, studio or something that's one of know. the things that I really like to do is I really like to enjoy other people's music like mm-hmm. I I really enjoy music to a different level like I when you talk about playlisting yep. I really spend a lot of time going through people's music just so that I can enjoy how much I how much love I can hear in their music and that kind of goes with food and that goes with people coming over my house Mm-hmm. and me curating times and all that stuff but uh outside of outside of music i would say now first thing i gotta tell you is that i'm very strange in the sense that i told you i have a very specific thing i can hear but i haven't seen television in many 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 years like 20 some years right <laughs> so i don't have a lot of things like that i watch and get inspiration uh it's more it's more walking like i like it's more simple things it's it's a lot of nature um i go to the mountains a lot um i love going on farms rural towns that's my vibe you know so that's kind of what inspires me that's what makes me go yeah let's go back in there and kick some butt you know are there any uh specific artists that you've kind of listened to recently or that you add to your playlist whether they're artists you've signed or or is it just you're just all over like just bringing it all on like um I my process is it's a blind process I go into new music Fridays okay um and then the, there's a couple of playlists that I check in on every Friday and without any bias or whatever I put a heart next to what I like um and then it goes into that and then I play that unbiased and then I un, and then I take things out that I don't like as much after hearing it again and then I keep taking things out and I keep taking things out until what I'm listening to just really inspires me. But I give everybody a really a fair shot just from mm-hmm. the standpoint of what the craft is, not the marketing plan, just the craft of music itself. So you're the co-founder, you're the head of your own record label and studio, Red Zone Entertainment, based in Atlanta. And I believe it was Sony that you have an agreement with. Um uh, you know, to do some work. Can you give us a quick overview? Like what's, what's a week like in the life of, of Tricky Stewart and, and maybe give us a little bit of, of insight into this new endeavor, the studio. I mean, this is, first of all, Atlanta's hot. I mean, Atlanta is the place right now. And, and I'm excited because we're only three hours up the road, right? In, in South yeah. Carolina, but there's so much going on in Atlanta when it comes to talent and creativity, both on the film side and the music side. And it's yeah. cool to see that you are such a big part of that. Can you tell us a little bit about this new endeavor that you have going on there with a the new studio and, and the label and everything? Yes. Yeah, so when I came back to Atlanta, my focus was really to build um freestanding things in Atlanta where I was truly in business for for myself you know uh, from the standpoint of I became as a person who uh, loves hospitality I became a little bit fascinated with the idea of getting in the transaction business which led me to what is my new passion which you're talking about which is Sessions Atlanta Um, Sessions Atlanta is a multi- faceted creative space or spaces. Um, We're taking all the things that I've seen over the last 30 years, putting them in under one roof uh, in a very boutique way. So we're talking at this particular Atlanta one, we're talking three recording studios or suites. I wouldn't necessarily call these recording studios. Each one of them comes with private dining, uh, private dining area. Each one has its own uh, vocal suite and uh comes with its own bar and wine and everything so 
we're not really in the studio business except we are taking this hospitality thing and putting it together. We've also added in there, we've put in a beauty bar for other creative entrepreneurs to come in. And in our business, it's very common for people to be able to build studios, build or book studios, I'm sorry. But I noticed that when hair people would come to town, they would always have to be in a hotel or something like that, or, you know, somebody's coming by the hotel. So we took that and we try to, we're going to put that in so that people can go, you know what, I'm coming to LA or I'm coming from LA to here for a couple of days and I need a place to be. And now they can rent studio time. We've also put in executive offices in an executive suite for, um, for any executive that wants to find themselves in a creative space when they're out of town. So you could come in, do your presentations. You have ultimately everything that you can stream from any place in the space. We have also um, ultimately the creative bar where we took mixology, put a beautiful bar in the middle of it because I'm always out. I'm always you know, um, entertaining. So I took that part of it, brought it all under one roof and now we're surrounding that creativity and we're created, curating um, a retail experience within that that is based in the five senses that uh, hits on the, the eye, eye, eyewear, I'm sorry, um, scent, clothing, fashion. So this is going to be a very unique concept in each market that we do. Uh, Sessions is opening November 15th, 2022. So we're very, very excited. We're pushing right now. So what a normal day is for me right now is I'm on a construction site in a dust storm every day. And around six o'clock, I rush home because I'm temporarily musically homeless uh, and I'm working from home and I'm running sessions out of my house, uh, which is really fun. It's been great. It started during quarantine, uh, just kind of continued. It's been a really great time to, to really refocus. And so that normal day, I'm on a construction site, I'm in the studio, and I'm building strategic partnerships to bring other vendors into the space, making sure, like I said, that I'm utilizing all my relationships um, that I've built over the years, getting critical information of how to make this successful because of the relationships that I've built and making sure that I'm building out the, the absolute, um, the right service in that when people walk into our experience, whether I'm there, whether I'm not there, that we are going to change the uh, the studio game and what it means to have the first musical film lot, what it means to have that first curated experience of luxury, hospitality, all under one roof, but centered around music and creative entrepreneurship. It sounds like an incredible space. And, and like you said, it's not just the music, it's an all around creative space that you're creating uh, for the for the whole community, really in Atlanta, but also for the artists that are coming and discovering uh, this space, um, that's amazing. We do have uh, I have tons of written questions coming through the chat, and I also see a couple attendees who raise their hands. So let's start with Cathedra Alexander. Are you able to unmute and turn on your camera, and then we'll go on to Joshua Jordan after that. Okay, uh, I think I'm unmuted. Let's see about yes, the camera. Yes, I can, can you hear see you. Me? Uh, I cannot right now. Is your camera on? Um, it should be. Let's see. Apologies. <laughs> but if not, you are welcome to ask while you're, okay. while you're working on that. I'm not sure where, what happened to the camera, but okay. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Stewart. Thank you for your service to the art of music. Um, my uh, initials are KP, and that stands for Karaoke Princess, so I'm all about music and also appreciate your service to hospitality, uh, which is definitely my other love why I'm here. And um, shout out to Atlanta, I lived in Decatur for a number of years. Mm -hmm. My question was about uh, sharpening your sword and what do you do to upskill to make sure that from a business savvy standpoint, from a musical ear standpoint, any other skills that you deem necessary, how do you um, keep raising the bar and learning 
essentially bottom line question is, you know, what do you do to keep learning? Um, I read, I read um, a lot and I particularly read books that people who I have a lot of respect for read. Um, I'm big on referral and um, I try to learn from smart people. Um, I spend a lot of time building genuine relationships with people that I think um, are like-minded. Uh, I go out of my way to build bridges with like-minded people. I'm not um, I'm not super social because the nature of my job is to be alone. But uh, when I see someone that has qualities and it doesn't matter what they do for a living, like I want to know, I, I just get into that approach. And I, when I, I learn so much from people just in different areas, um, you know, friends that I talk to a lot, it's a friend that runs a valet company and, and, you know, he, him and his brother have built this thing up from the ground up. And it's really just like, watching their dedication and their, you know, their, their mindset to parking and like, how do they create more spaces and generate more money and, and all those types of things. It gets my brain going. And I just, every single person, I'm, I just learn as much as I can from people that I have respect for. Let's go on to, I think, Joshua Jordan. And so I know you, uh, the, the, with the web webinar, it's it's just the, the sound only. So feel free to unmute and uh, ask your question. All right. Can you hear me? Yep, sure <clears throat> can. All right. How you doing, Mr. Stewart? Uh, first off, I wanted to say, Shay's looking nice. <laughs> You're looking <laughs> nice right now. Um, but I go by the name of Joshua Jordan on our platforms. Um, and my two questions that I have for you, one is how can I contact you personally? Now I know that question, the answer to that question might be a little tricky, but uh, the second question that I have for you is how do I obtain a bigger audience? Uh, I know you were talking about uh, the feeling of when somebody makes music, you want to hear the love, or you know, the, you want to cry. So that actually made me think about a song that I have. It's called "I Want to Cry" by Joshua Jordan, and I think you, I think you would really, really love it. And uh, honestly, I think that uh, I could add to your legacy um, if you if you if you were to like it. But uh, those are the two questions that I have for you. Um, yeah, that, it's uh, it's always easy to hit me. Like, I'll, I'll, if you hit me in the DMs, I'm pretty responsive um, all the time. That's that's the best way, and then we'll connect from there. And um, I'll give you an address, like an email, to uh, send send the record to. What was the um, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. The second, <clears throat> the second part of my question was how to obtain a bigger audience. How do, how do I get my music to be heard by more people? Um, I don't. It's hard to say because I don't know exactly what you're doing at this point. But um, you know, obviously, the the most important places are to be places where music is important. SoundCloud is a platform for social media where music ultimately, everybody that shows up to SoundCloud shows up for music reasons. They don't show up for pictures. They don't show up for anything else. It's just a place where music gets shared. So I would definitely suggest being there. Um, I would also suggest being on YouTube um, because um, one of the main things that I always talk about is if you get what you want, make sure that, um, make sure that you're going to be happy with it. Those are the two platforms that if you spend time figuring out how to build on, then you'll be able to monetize those platforms. If you do it on Instagram or Facebook, there's there's really nothing to do except get social currency and and get fed by um, get fed by likes and things like that. But if you're really really trying to build that audience, uh, SoundCloud and YouTube is the place to to show up to. Great, and I see uh, Rashid, you had your hand up. You there, Rashid? Yeah, yeah. Thank you All so right. much. Um, yeah. I wanted to wanted to ask Tricky um, to uh, talk a little bit about some of the uh, internships uh, and opportunities that you may offer potentially at sessions over the summer. I think that obviously the college through its sports uh, and entertainment management program, and as well as hospitality program, there's so many different facets that can serve sessions as well. So maybe you can talk a little bit about any of those opportunities and offerings. Yes, um, we will be doing about two interns per quarter. Um, 
because ultimately we are in the hospitality side of it and uh, we will, there will be a food component to our, our elements. And there's also a bar and mixology element where we'll need people that are in the service element of uh, bar services and things like that. But overall, the, the overall theme of our space is, um, is hospitality, but in specific as it pertains to, uh, if it's not music, then it would be centered around the uh, around the mixology portion of our uh, of our studio because the other part would be um, music specific as far as um, if there was someone that had uh, music knowledge and also wanted to be in hospitality because one of our goals is to have all the people that work at our space also be a creative so that it's a place that they want to come on their days off, you know, and, and that's very important to the culture that we want to create. So it's really about if there's a music base, if we have a music base with a person who's in particularly into hospitality, that is the absolute sweet spot for us. And then the other part would be where we have um, our mixology part where we're going to have our bar in the middle, which is called mix. Very cool. Um, you're incredibly busy. Are there books that you are either currently reading or are there books you've read that really impacted you or, you know, change your life or, you know, that you would possibly recommend? Um, the two, two books that I would definitely recommend that have a tremendous, app, um, tremendous uh, impact on me. One is called The Secret that I read many, many years ago. And one thing about me, when I read a book, I don't read to get finished. Like I will read a book, like I carry that book with me. Like if I'm on it, it's on with me in every trip because I don't know when I'm gonna need it. And uh, so The Secret was definitely um, a book where I was wanted to work on the type of people. Uh, I wanted to have, I, what I got out of it, I should say, is the power of the law of attraction and how to create a, uh, an energy and a spirit around what I was doing that made people excited, that made them feel valued, and that ultimately uh, something more significant than just going through life. And uh, The Secret changed my life in that sense. And then right now, I would say there's a book that I'm really focused on that's called Who's Not How. Um, and the Who's Not How is changing my life because it's all about giving context to you. You can, when you show up and ask who, who knows the information to this versus how do you do it? There's just a big difference when you get real experience from people who have done things in a real way. So I spend a lot of time, as I spoke about with people that have real experience in the things that I want to have goals in. And it cuts down the time of really building relationships, of, of having people and and having people in your life that ultimately can help you with the situations that uh, you want to level up in. And so to the young lady who asked the first question, that's a lot of what I spend my time doing uh, in sharpening that sword is really having conversations and uh, with with people that are that inspire me and and reading or watching videos of people who inspire me to understand how to unlock my thinking, you know, how to how to keep pushing forward with new ideas, how to find what's not there and then jump into that opportunity and create it before someone else does. That's amazing. Um... I'm gonna, we have just a few few more minutes left and I, I see some hands up. So I wanna give the students a chance. Um, John, let's start with you. John Stringer, if you can just unmute uh, and you should be good to go. Thanks so much. Uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Tricky Stewart. Thank you, uh, Rashid, for putting the invitation out. So glad to make it. Um, you just mentioned a, a couple of uh, recommendations. The Secret was life-changing for me. Uh, law of Attraction, etc. So glad to hear you mention that. I will be checking out the second recommendation. Haven't heard of that book yet. But I wanted to ask you, what type, excellent, 
Oh, gap in the game. Then I'll write that down too. <laughs> so I also wanted to ask you, uh, since you mentioned law of attraction, are there any types of practices that you use such as for both creatively and just in general for your life practices such as meditation or anything like that? Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time getting a quiet head. I don't know what I do. I don't know if what I do is called meditation. It's more like I'm very prayerful. Um, I spend a lot of time in prayer. I won't say a lot of time. I spend time in prayer, but I don't have a right time to do it or a wrong time to do it. I do it all day. Um, and then I spend time being quiet, you know, uh, and just listening to just listening without really having a thought you know and so those two things you know I don't know that I've made it to meditation you know I I, I know people that meditate that are getting a whole lot out of it I don't know that I'm getting it just quite yet because I got a lot of noise in here and so I don't I don't really know how to quiet it down but that listening sounds like a meditation in and of itself so thank you for that oh in nature that was the other thing you mentioned going out in nature so appreciate oh, yeah, it. I love I love nature all right uh brandon you're up next hey how you doing today mr stewart great thank you i just want to ask you a quick question what do you think the best album release of this year was other than beyonce's renaissance since you have producer credits on it um the best album released this year yes Katie Musgraves was last year. Um, let me think. Probably Harry Styles. Or Harry Styles or Lizzo. They did drop some good albums this year, so I'll give you that. I mean, there's I mean, there's so many good albums that I really like, you know, but if you gotta say my favorite album of the last little bit was Doja Cat. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, that's my that's my jam. Have you heard Steve Lacey's new album? I've heard some of it. I, I'm checking in. I'm a little late on that one. I got to be honest. All I know is the song. Yeah, he's a great artist. You should give him a listen. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. So we are about uh, finishing up here. Uh, I do want to thank you, Tricky. There's one more. This is just a, a fact question. I guess somebody said, how did you get the nickname, Tricky? <laughs> My mom gave me the nickname, Tricky. Um, in my family, you get a nickname. I, um, and so it's Tricky, Kook, Bunchy, Laney, Weave. Like everybody has a, everyone has a nickname, but it's it's literally, um, they were all given to us by family. So, you know, mine came from um, playing football. I was an athlete. It was very difficult to tackle. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom was just like, Tricky. He says Tricky. So. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I, I mean, really, this has been incredible. I, I want to thank you for your time and for being a part of our our program today. I also want to take a quick moment to thank Rashid Muhammad, who is an alum of HRSM and, and made the connection. You know, what you talked about really encompasses what our college is about. When you're talking about this creative space, the hospitality, the mixology, the you know, the, from the hair and nails to the studio and, and the music and the management and the creativity. So I, I really hope oh, we have yoga and photography too. Wow. So, <laughs> wow. So hopefully we can collaborate. I, I look forward to having the opportunity to visit, but I think even more importantly, we need to try to, to drag you up to, to USC in South Carolina. And I think you'll be really impressed with what not only what our college offers, but the incredible and driven energetic students that we have that are out there always working events and, and learning on the spot. So, so I, I want to thank you for your time and I look forward to collaborating with you through our many departments and programs here at the College of, of HRSM. Thank you so much, Tricky, for, for joining us today. Thank you so much. I had a great time. I think you guys have an amazing school. Um, I couldn't be, this is the perfect, um, this is the per perfect place for me, like even to have this conversation, because I know that you guys are dedicated. I know where you rank. I know that this is something that you guys are passionate about. It's something that I'm passionate about. And that's where great things can really happen. So thank you for having me. I appreciate you all.
Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone attending. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.